Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Good morning, John, online. Let's just stand up and upgrade his spirit this morning. Praise God from the Lord, let Thank you. 
Is there any malice there? Is there any greed? Is there anything within a brother or sister in Christ that you need to get right? The Bible is very clear to us that you should not think of giving in until you made that right with your brother or sister in the Lord. That's just a warning. I want us to go before the Lord. Ask Him to look inside of our hearts and then we will remember what Christ did to all of us. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, breathe on our hearts. Look inside of us, Lord. God, I pray that if there's anything that needs to be revealed, that you reveal it to us, Lord. Right now. Harboring ill feelings towards someone or somebody. upper room the night before he was betrayed into the hands of Jesus. He took a loaf of bread. He raised it up and he broke it. And he told his disciples that this is my body that's broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. There will be no more shedding of blood, no more shedding of tears. Thank you, Lord, for the covenant, the blood covenant you made through your son Jesus. Without it, God, we are nothing. We come before you with humble praise and adoration. As we, we introduce the new song, and uh, let's, as we continue to worship, let's just stand and we're going to sing this chorus again for those who may be new to this song. And it's just declaring about God's goodness and just his steadfast nature for all of us, and his promise that he never leaves and he never forsakes us. So let's sing this chorus this morning as we learn this new song. In God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. There will never be. Let's sing that out, 
holding on. There's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God. There will never be.
There will be no problem, Father. Regardless of the news and the media said, God, you are the ultimate hope. You are the ultimate truth. So we declare out this morning that there is no one like you. Let's sing that out. Don't let me be. Never be anyone like you. Never be anyone like you. Never be anyone like you. God. Sing that out. Never be anyone like you. Never be anyone like you. Never be anyone like you.
time, looking at Revelation chapter 2. And it's there that we see the first letter, and, and if you look at the way the churches are on a map, or in modern day churches, and this is actually a Roman um, mail route that was given. So even though these churches are, are listed, it's also listed within a mail route. And so the first church that Jesus uh, talks to and writes to is this church in Ephesus. And we were reminded last week that God uh, talked about the good things in Ephesus. Because they were doing a lot of great things. But in the effort of doing so, they maybe put up some walls. And they got so religious that they forgot their first love. They had forgotten the height from which they had fallen. And that's why when we come back together and we worship like we did, when we remember what Christ had done for us, man, it just it makes us want to well up and shout and praise. Amen, church? That's what it's all about. So this week, we're going to look at the second letter written to this church. And I want to remind you that these are real places. These are real churches at a real time. But remember, these are, this is a prophetic letter that John is writing. It's a, it's a vision that God gave him as he was on the island of Patmos. And as we read this, I want you to remember that the living Word of God, it was relevant then, it was relevant now, and it will be relevant in the future. And as we read this, remember that it happened, it's happening, and it's going to happen again. So as we read these letters, yes, they were written to real church. Yes, they were written at a specific time period, but yes, they are still relevant today, and I guarantee you the Word of God will always be relevant for tomorrow. It's our hope. So, let's look at, before we dig into this letter, let's dive into what is this letter written to? Who is this church, the church of Smyrna? Smyrna actually is... uh, still around as opposed to Ephesus. Now, I did a little bit of digging, and you can go online and look. Ephesus, uh, the city, no longer exists. And uh, there's lots of theories of what happened to it, but one of the best ones I could find was actually that the water went back. The uh, natural water, the drinking water they used upstream actually changed directions and dried up, and they were uh, no longer had any good water to drink. So the city of Ephesus Today, it's just ruined. But the city of Smyrna still exists today, but it's a different name. In fact, it's the name of Izmir, Turkey. That's where it is today. And it's home to about 4 million people. It is a beautiful city. In fact, many people still call it to this day the Pearl of the Aegean Sea. And Izmir, Turkey is a uh, can be traced back, as well as to the name Smyrna, uh, over 4,000 years ago. So this is a rich city with a rich history, and it's still around to this day. But let me describe what was happening in the biblical time of Smyrna. Smyrna was a beautiful city, just like it is today. It was very prosperous. It excelled in things like beauty and science. The great poet Homer was from this city. It was a trade city known for its wealth. It was home to the temple of Tiberius. Tiberius was a Caesar. This town was a proud, a proud Roman city. So much so that unless you worship Caesar, or you worship the government, you were chastised. You were shut down. It also had a very large Jewish population. In fact, it still does to this day. So the Jews that weren't being converted into Christianity, they were very much opposed to these 
Jews telling other Jews about Jesus. So this city, not only were the Romans opposing Christianity, but even the Jewish brothers were opposed to the spread of Christianity. So everywhere this new Christ, these new Christians went, they were faced with all kinds of opposition. That's the setting of this church. That's who Jesus is writing to. So let's pick up the story in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to walk through this, and we're going to put pauses to explain. The intro says this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Let's take a pause really quick. What is Jesus doing? If we know what we know now about the, the city and the church of Smyrna, we know that it's facing big-time persecution. It's, it's facing all kinds of opposition. And Jesus is reminding them who the Alpha and the Omega is. He's reminding them that Jesus overcame death. You know what? I think sometimes we just need to be reminded who our daddy is. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, when we're faced and we're in those tough situations, you're facing opposition. Sometimes we, as the children of God, need to remember who Abba Father is. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Do we realize what is unpacked within that statement? In fact, we see it throughout all of the Bible. Whenever God wants to relay His majesty, when He wants to relay His power, He goes right back to, I am the Creator. I am the Alpha and the Omega. You better remember where you come from. You better remember what power lies behind all of this. So that is the first thing that God is reminding this church of, is that who their dad is. That He's been through this. He knows. He is the beginning and the end, and He will always be with them. In fact, I think the bigger thing that He's telling this early church is, don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of this persecution, this opposition. Face it. As we continue to read this letter, I want to show you that following Jesus requires three things. And not requires, but it brings. If you follow Jesus, especially in this time period, we knew that following Jesus brings tribulation, it brings awareness, and it brings reward. Right? If you're taking notes, you're writing that down at home, write that down. Because as we go through this letter, you're going to see that if you follow Jesus, there will be tribulation, they will raise awareness of Jesus Christ, and it'll also show that there's a reward to be gained. So let's continue on and look at tribulation. Verse 9. It says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Time out. I underline that word affliction. In fact, if you do a word study of that and you look at different even translations into the English, the word there can either be tribulation or the word affliction. In fact, when you do a deeper word study, you'll find that the words tribulation and affliction are interchangeable with each other many times throughout the New Testament. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because I think you and I, our brains have been programmed that the end times we we associate that with the word tribulation, right? We're going to go through off trip, pre trip, post trip, pan trip. That's what you guys say. You all pan out. But what will I have to face? That's what we were always worried about, right? Will I have to go through the tribulation? And we fought over this. That's the church. We fought over whether or not we will have to go through tribulation. But when you look at that word, all it really means is affliction, hardship. And when you look at through the New Testament, the word is solipsis. Solipsis is the word that they translate affliction or tribulation, and it's found many, many times throughout the New Testament. The church has always thought 
Scripture. Listen to me. Remember, it's happened, it's happening, it's going to happen again. Do you not know that the church has faced tribulation ever since Jesus was resurrected? They've faced all kinds of opposition and doubt. We face many of it today. If we think, listen to me, church, if we think that we will not have to endure opposition, as we follow Jesus. I'm wondering what God we're following according to the biblical God. Because it was normal for him. In fact, I would say it was even expected, as we'll see as we go on. So basically, it's, it's, what's happening as Jesus is writing this is it would be the equivalent as if the church of Siena was posting pictures and posting things on Instagram, and Jesus was given a double tap, a double life, right? And he's saying, I see you. I see what you're going through. I know what opposition and accusation and tribulations that you're going through. So Jesus is reaffirming the church. I see what you're going through. I know what you're going through. So he says, I know your afflictions. And your, what did he say? Poverty. The poverty. He saw that they were losing their businesses. In fact, I dug, I dug into it a little bit, and the history is, is that if you did not worship Caesar, if you did not worship Rome, they would literally take your businesses away. You couldn't conduct business. They wouldn't give you money. So can you imagine these early Christians in this church? They're literally having their livelihood stripped away. There was no such thing as religious freedom unless you paid homage to Caesar. Are you understanding the, the, the climate that's happening in the church of Smyrna? So many of the Christians were living in poverty, extreme poverty. And guys, when I talk about poverty and I talk about tribulation, I'm not talking about King of the Hill joking on Jesus. I'm not talking about South Park making fun of Jesus on a cross. I'm talking about you, you literally losing your livelihood and living in poverty. That's the tribulation I'm trying to describe today. And he says, I know your poverty, but look what he says. And yet you are how can it be? You can't have one, you know, you can't be poor, living in poverty, but also rich, right? But what was he saying to them? He wasn't talking about monetary things. He says, but yet you are rich. What were they rich in? Spiritual things. They were rich because they knew Jesus. I can remember as a young boy, I was out with my dad. And you guys know that when you get the my dad didn't see me, and I'm going like this. And as the semi's passing, it's like, ah! my dad's like freaking out, right? Like, why is he honking at me? And then he sees me over there, a little five-year-old, just going like this. He's like, oh, I get it now. But I remember the conversation right after that. Dad was a little bit worried, and, you know, we'll joke sometimes, you know, in our westernized world, that, you know, man, anything's just tight, you know, we're, 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 we're kind of poor right now. And he said it not thinking, and I just got out of Sunday school the week before, and I looked at Dad, and I said, Dad, we're not poor. We're rich. We know Jesus. I can remember my dad, it really striking him at the moment. I can remember him sharing that story the next week at, at church. But even as a child, I realized what was truly to gain. I didn't know what money was, really. I mean, I knew it was green, and you could buy stuff with it. That wasn't what was important to me. What was important to me was knowing you. So yet you can be poor and yet be rich. It's crazy to me when we actually get out of our little bubble and visit other countries where they're literally being persecuted for Jesus, that they're just some of the happiest people you will ever meet. And yet, looks 
liking it. He's double tapping it. I see it. know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. What's he saying here? Remember, if you've read your Bible, for a Jew to turn in another Jew, you weren't considered to be a Jew anymore. So the Jews were turning in other Jews because they had turned to Christianity. That's what Jesus is basically saying. They're not being Jews anymore. They're not acting like they're Jews. I see the affliction. I see what you're going through. They're deceitful. They're turning you into the authority. They were literally going to the Roman authority and turning their brothers and sisters in. Now, to a Jew at this time period, this was considered the worst thing you could ever do to another Jew. Because Jesus called the worst. That's the church of Satan. And he had some hard work for him, didn't he? Those are, those are little churches, synagogues of Satan. So these Jews were opposed to the spread of Christianity, and they're calling out their Jewish uh, converts and turning them in. And all of this could have been different. And they could have been saved from their persecution. All they had to do was to say, Hail Caesar. All they would have had to have done was to say, I am worshiping Caesar, Tiberius. But they didn't. Most of the church of Smyrna became martyrs. In fact, one of the most famous martyrs of this church was the bishop of Cal- uh, his name was Polycarp. How many of you ever heard of Polycarp? A couple of you. Man, we ought to know his story. What an amazing, amazing martyr. It was said that in his elder age that Polycarp would not turn away and deny Christianity. He would not deny Jesus. So they took him to the to this place in front of thousands and thousands of people, and they literally lit him on fire. And legend has it, in fact, it's it's pretty well documented, that as they lit him on fire, the flames did not engulf him. He wasn't dying. So what they had to do is they took spears, and they literally speared him to death as he had these flames all around him. told to us, right before they lit him on fire, they gave him one more chance to denounce Christianity, to denounce Jesus, and this is what Paul Carr said. Eighty-six years have I served him, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my faith? And I wonder if he said, let me know. Why is it that we don't feel like there will be any affliction or tribulation for us in our lives? Why do we think that we'll never experience any sort of persecution for Jesus' name's sake? And I want you to read the, the martyr's blood. I want you to see what Jesus did. He never once fought them. They literally laid down their lives. Why is it, church, that we think that we won't face any of this? Jesus actually said it in Matthew 10, 22. All men 
will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus, will be, what to say? Persecuted. Uh, listen, guys, I can't look and read the Bible and, and shake it and not come out with this idea that I'm never going to face any kind of persecution or tribulation in my life. I can't find it. It's not there. We've made this American church bubble that we think we're immune from all of it. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. In fact, remember what I said. This was written to people like churches in Smyrna that were being persecuted. They were being burned alive. And it was written to them not as a fear mode, but as an encouragement. Stand firm till the end. Don't you give up. A little bit different letter than last week, right? Last week he starts in, he tells all these great things that the church was doing. Did he start off this one that way? No, what did he say? I see you. I see that you're being burned alive. I see that they're persecuting you. I see that they're taking away your livelihood. I see you. And what he say? Rise up. Do something about it. Start a revolution. Start a, start a revolt. Is that what he did? Give in. Stand firm in the spiritual matter. Stand firm in the things that truly matter. In fact, it was Tertullian that said the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. Suffering church always produces awareness about Jesus. Verse 10 says, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. That's what Jesus told us. You're going to suffer. We, 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 don't like, we don't like to read that, right? Oh, God's going to fix me up. It literally says, I see you. Stand firm. You're going to suffer. And because of that suffering, listen to me, church. Because of that suffering, the church literally Even at this time period, Tiberius and the Roman government couldn't figure out, why do we keep killing them and they keep growing? Why do we kill this little pocket of Christians and then another one pops up in another town? Why does this keep happening? We see it even today, church. You know some of the fastest growing churches in America are in the worst places to be a Christian. It makes no sense. Why? Because we can go right back to the book of Revelation and see, church, that tribulation and persecution actually brings awareness to Jesus. It brings awareness to the gospel. I want to show you a map. This is from 2020. It's from opendoorsusa.com. Of the 50 most persecuted countries for Christians in the world. And you can read, if you go to their website, the things that, listen, we're not talking about 1930s. We're talking about concentration camps literally in 2020 existing in the world today. We're talking about if you worship anything other than some of these countries, and worshiping the state like North Korea, who's number one on that list, you are literally thrown into a concentration camp. Literally. It's documented. They'll try to hide it, but it's documented. In fact, it's happening in China right now. Not just with Christians, but Muslims too. And yet, can I get on the soapbox for a minute? And yet,
found that the United States, according to this study, didn't even sniff the top 50 in the world of being persecuted. And yet, all I ever hear right now is, I can't believe how bad the Christian church is here in America and how we're being persecuted. Are we? Because I look at what's happening and it's nothing compared to what our brothers and sisters are going through for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about just 2020. You can go back for the last 2,000 years and church, this has been happening. It's happened, it's happening, and it's going to happen again, church. In fact, I would say and argue if you want to just use the Bible, you can't get away from it probably going to happen to you in your lifetime. Now, I will say, what a privilege it's been to be a Christian in the United States of America for those that fight for those freedoms so that we can have religious liberty. Amen? But we need to really understand, church, in America what persecution really looks like. Because as we we also know that there's a great reward to have. He says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Can you imagine Polycarp being being burned alive? You can't touch this. You can't touch this. God's got me. And he was willing, listen, that, that letter was written to Polycarp. He was a part of that church. And he said, I'll lay down my life. I'll, I'll lay everything for the crown. And we think of this giant crown when we get to heaven, right? That's not what they would have imagined. You know what they imagined? They imagined the Greek or the Roman athlete. And when they won the race, they were given just a little wreath placed upon their head. You guys have seen it in the Olympics. That's what it actually translates to. Not this king's crown. It was just a victor's wreath. That God will place upon those who stand firm till the end. They did not give in. They stood till the end, even if it meant death. Now, this just doesn't sell, does it? It doesn't sell Christian books. But it's here, it's everywhere in Scripture. And that word 10, now remember. He was probably writing, I guarantee you, there were some people within that church that literally suffered ten literal days. I do believe that. But what it also means, as you read that, even as a Jew, that ten often meant that it was a sign of completion. We do it in the Olympics again, right? When they go off the diving board, they're in gymnastics, what do they give them? A eight out of ten. A nine out of ten. Ten being the black, no. Ten being completion. It was no different than back then. He's basically saying to the church, you will have to suffer, suffer until it's complete. Until you've, until you've gotten a 10 out of 10. Then, it will be over. And I will give you a crown. Church, what we understood, and I think what we forget is that every one of us will die. Every one of us will suffer death. Every one of us. The question not, is not if you're going to die. The question is, is how are you going to live? And will you stand? Because what he's saying right here is that you shouldn't fear the first death. You should fear the second death. The second death. Remember what I told you in reading Revelation? Always remember to finally read the end. Get 
get to the end. Because you know what the end says? Let's look there. Revelation 21, verse 6. At the end of Revelation, or towards the end, he says, He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Wow, this is sounding familiar, right? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And the end. To him, him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. Overcomes what? The tribulation, the persecution. He who endures that. But the cowardly, the cowardly, who's he talking about? Those that give in. Those who deny Jesus. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You want to know what Jesus was writing to the early church of Smyrna? He was telling them, don't fear the first death, fear the second death. And when you read further on, you realize what the second death is. It's a death for eternity. Whether or not you want to take the imagery literally or not, the point being is that there is going to be a second death. We know that. And what God is telling you and me is that you'd better fear the second death more than the first one. I think if Jesus were to write a letter to the church universal right now, especially in the country where we have seen amazing times of prosperity, even for Christians, the drawback to that church is this, hear me out, is that eventually you become so comfortable with where you're at. Don't fear the second death. You fear the first one. Are you following me? All men die. Not all men truly live. We need to fear the second death more than the first one. Because I think if Jesus were to write a letter right now, that have gone before us and we stand upon their shoulders. They said, light me up, I don't care. I will never deny my Jesus. I will never deny my Jesus. I will never deny my Savior. And they willingly laid down their lives and they never, never worshipped anything other than Jesus. Holy Spirit, right now, 
Lord, in our hearts, say, Oh, death, where is thy sin? Because we know who holds us in our hands. We know who our dad is. We know who our father is. And the church gave a great clap offering to the Lord Almighty right here and right now that you are God and you are good and you will not leave us. And I pray, Lord, that we stand with our brothers and sisters who are who are suffering in persecution. I pray, God, that you will strengthen the church to stop worrying about what we're going through and start living out your love, your compassion, your mercy, and that we raise awareness for Jesus Christ and that his church shall always prevail. Let it be so, Lord. Let it be so. Thank <laughs> you. 
find out where we're going when we be opening up our children. With that being said, and I just say, we need to know. I don't care if it's nursery all the way up to fifth grade. I don't care if you're a teenager. You're in middle school. We would love to have you back there now. It's time to start to get back to those who get back to you. Even if you're 35 years old. I'm so grateful for those who poured into my life in 2017. Because I remember what God put in my heart in the seeds of God's Word. So be a part of that. So come out this Wednesday. Please let me and Terry know or send us an email at broadcaster at gmail.com and say I'll be there on Wednesday. If you can't be there and want to help, please let us know still. We want to keep you up to date. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. And it is important. I do that. It was super fun, dude. Like, it really is. Like, if you go back online and, and watch some of our old sermons back, like, last Christmas, I was standing up here in a house costume because uh, we were teaching uh, the kids to be Christmas. It was super, super fun. And, uh, and the, the thing that was so cool about that is that we, it's, it makes me, it reminds me of what Jesus said as far as you can't enter the kingdom of heaven without the faith of a little child, you know? And so what better way to really experience that than to be around those children? And I want to work with like Jay over here, man. He gets into it, dude. And I, that's, that's, what I want, that's what I want to strive for, you know? And it's, it's a super fun time. And so you, like Kathy just said, if you feel led to, to, to serve back there in any capacity, uh, come be with us on Wednesday, send us an email, talk to us. It was really, really fun. Uh, and we would really love to have you there. And, and what's really cool is I've been really encouraged, and I hope you have too, not just with this service series, but with, I feel like, all of the service series up to this point in 2020, uh, regardless of what we've been going through or all the chaos in this world, I, I feel like the, 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 the lasting theme that's been going on is standing firm. And I think it's a really cool reminder for all of us to stand firm because we all go to our own path. We all suffer through things in our own way. Maybe not like other people, you know, maybe not in the same way, but we all do suffer and hurt. And, and, and what was what, beautiful about it is that we can come together as a church family and say, well, how can I pray for you? How can I be there for you? How can I support you? How can I help you? You know, how can I shine the light of Jesus with you and for you? You know, so thank you guys for bringing me this really great theme of family first. And I think it's an awesome reminder for all of us today. We want to thank you as well for everybody here in the, in the sanctuary and those online as well who have been continuing to faithfully give, uh, especially through this tough time. Uh, we, we know that those, those tithes and offerings are honoring to God and they're being used to further His kingdom. Uh, so, uh, like every week, there's, there's multiple ways to give. Uh, my dad's standing at the door over there with the baskets. You can drop your uh, tithes and offerings on your way out. Uh, there's also online ways to give to our online website portal uh, as well, or you can text the number on the screen. Uh, and we would, uh, we would just love to continue to partner, partner with you as you continue to work towards the advancement of God's kingdom. So, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer as we, as we uh, uh, thank God for our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you so much for your love, uh, for your mercy, and for your encouragement to stand firm. Uh, everybody suffers in their own way, like I was just saying. And, and, and we see that. And we thank you that you see us. You see us in our lowest of lows. You see us in our darkest times. And Lord, we thank you that every single time you're always faithful. You always rise us up out of the muck and mire. We ask that you bless the tithes and offerings and bless the people that have generous hearts, God. We ask you to use those tithes and offerings to, to advance your kingdom continually. We love you and we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that are truly on the church And help us to know that you pray to stand firm and stand up for what we believe in and stand up for you. We love you. We thank you. We pray for you. Hey, good morning, church. We're happy that you're here today or you're tuning in online. My name is Pastor Allen, and here are some announcements that you need to know. 
Hey volunteers, if you serve in any capacity here at our church, we have team nights coming up and they've been happening all month long. And this week we have our Next Gen and VC Connect teams. They're going to be meeting right here on the church on Wednesday. And next week, August 12th, our Engage and Journey group leaders will be meeting at Pastor Jess's house. Come be in community and have a time of renewal and fellowship. Are you interested in being baptized and made new in Christ? We're hoping a baptism in a couple of weeks at the oceanfront on August 22nd. We're meeting right at 31st Street at 5 p.m. Email us at broadcastchurch at gmail.com to sign up. One of our values here at Broadcast is multiplication. And every year we have a friend day to help reach people for Christ. In September 13th, we're asking all of our broadcasters to invite a friend because we really do believe we're better together. So be praying and thinking about how you can invite someone and be in community. We can't do what we do here at Broadcast Church without our faithful volunteers. And this week, we want to honor an OG, as we say, to Broadcast, who has recently come back, my good friend, Matt Jasper. Jasper, as we call him, has been a friend of mine for a long time, and he served with me in my old church. And he joined me here at Broadcast in 2013. And after some time away, Matt has given his life back to the Lord and he's serving his church. And he did a great job today on the drums. And it's so good to have him back here in our broadcast family. Matt, we're better together with you, man. We're thankful for you. And we're so glad that you're on our team. We hope you have an awesome and blessed week. God bless and we'll see you soon.